midst of everything we worry about, we dream about, we work for, Lord, we always come back to realize that you've given us everything we need within us. Through your Holy Spirit, through your salvation, through your grace, your love, your nearness, God, this morning I just pray, Lord, that each and every one of us would have a heart and a mind in gratitude things that already are, that have already been promised, that are already given, that you love us, that you're near us. Father, today I pray for your Holy Spirit to be at work as we get the privilege of singing and of worshiping, lifting you up above ourselves. ago and still actively seeking to reach and speak to us, Lord, that you would do that by your, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that each and every person would hear your loving, the loving call of their Father speaking to them today, connecting to them today, reaching down into their very lives today. That we would be drawn to you. That we would see Worship team. Oh, they're gone. <laughs> That's good. It's like magic. Hey, y'all. It's good to see your lovely faces again. I've been gone for a little while. Oh, Peter, you're a little shorter than me. It's all right. Uh, how are y'all doing then? You sure? You ready for the word? All right, will you stand for the reading of God's Word? We're in the last week of our Summer Love series. Next week, Sarah kind of shared with you, I'm going to be going into a brand new series that I am pumped about. It's something I felt like uh, while I was away on my break that the Holy Spirit gave me, and it really started to minister to me in the last couple of months as I've been into it. Uh, we're going to be studying the book of Ecclesiastes. It's got to be one of the weirdest craziest books in the Bible. Uh, it's so hard to understand it sometimes, and yet I'm looking forward to it because there's so much depth, so much richness uh, in it, and I hopefully, I, I just, uh, I'm pumped about it. If, you, if you'll join us uh, next week for that series, today we get to close Summer Love. We're going to close the end of 1 Corinthians 13, which we've been in for a number of weeks, and uh, here's what it says. It says, I'm going to read from, even though I started late there, I'm going to read from uh, 4, because that's the most famous part. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes and it always perseveres. And from our slide, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So, as I've said a number of times uh, through this series, this is one of the most popular passages of all time, not just in the Bible, but on love. You can hear this anywhere. You can hear it, you know, you go to Hobby Lobby, you can find 20, 20 things with this verse on there, you know. Um, 
It is such a popular verse because it sounds so sweet. You go to weddings and they'll share this. And I'm like, if you only knew the context, it's not as sweet as it sounds. Now, it is sweet to describe love this way. It is uh, patient. It is kind. This is where you hear it. It does not boast. It is not proud. It sounds so good. You're like, yeah, I love love. But when you know why Paul is talking about love and trying to impress what love is to these people, it's, it's not super sweet. He's actually being very confrontive on multiple fronts. He's talking to a group of people who he's planted this church. They, they've come to know Christ, and they were all excited about knowing Jesus and receiving the gospel, and then they did what we do. They became religious They became fanatical about what they like about God. They ended up getting these spiritual gifts, what can be called tongues or prophecies. or, And then they begin battling about those gifts, going, whose is better? Oh, I have tongues. You don't have tongues. Oh, you must not have the Holy Spirit. Oh, I have prophecies. Prophecy is better than tongues. And they all just started going, look at what we have. Look at what we do. Look at how good I am versus you, and you don't have this. And they start measuring each other. And they start battling and arguing and trying to figure out who's better. And he goes, you guys know all these things and you have this special revelation and you have these gifts. And yet you have not love. And what he's saying in the rest of this passage is if you have not love, all the other stuff is stupid. Like you're missing the whole front of what this is about. But in this passage, he he really hammers it home. He's not being nice. If you really zero in on this passage we just read, he's like, oh, man, love never fails. And you go, oh, it's sweet. He says, but where all your prophecies are that you're all excited about, they're going to end. And you know all those tongues you like to babble on and on with and be proud of? They won't be in heaven. They're going to come to an end. They will be stilled. All you who love how much knowledge you have and your theology and your perfect understanding of the world, knowledge will pass away, at least the way you understand it. But he says this, and this is where he's being shady. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but now I'm a man. And I put childish things behind me. He's telling them, you guys are like children. In fact, the word he uses is, you're like infants. You're infantile. You're like infants, and you're supposed to be Christians, and you're supposed to be more mature, and you're supposed to have known Christ, and you're acting like infants. Yes, we read in the Bible that you should have a childlike faith. That's not what he's addressing here. He's saying you have a childish faith. Childlike faith is a hopefulness, a, a excitement for God. Childish is making this whole thing about you and right now and what you can see and what you think you know. There was a funny story. It's unfortunately true. Um, there was a group of people meeting here, and somebody that I have talked to a lot was in that group, and they were talking about What's the hardest like, thing anybody's ever said to you? And they, said, they told the whole group, they were like, somebody once called me infantile. And the whole group gasped. They're like, <gasps> who would say such a thing? And then they came to me. They're like, did you know somebody told this person that they were infantile? Can you believe it? And I said, not only can I believe it, I said it. But you got to know the context. I wasn't being mean. They asked me, they said, what is something you see in my faith that needs to be strengthened in my relationships? And I said, sometimes you can be a bit infantile. And it sounds like a mean word, but what I'm saying is you're devolving love and God into what it does for you and what you're not getting out of it. 
And this is a person I have trust and friendship with. So, but for the group, it was funny. Who would say that? I'm like, Pastor Nick. That's who. Because I do love the people I'm with. And if I love them, I'm going to say, hey, this is what I'm seeing, like Paul. He says, hey, you guys are supposed to be here and you're being children. You know, sometimes it's okay to be children. So for those, as you listen to this message, <clears throat> you know when it's a good time to be children? When you're children. When you're two and you throw a tantrum, we don't go, what an idiot. Well, maybe you do. But you shouldn't because you go, this is normal. But when you're 20 and you're throwing a tantrum, you go, what is mentally wrong with you? Right? Like, what is happening, Karen? I don't know what happened. See, and I'm going to tell you it's the same thing spiritually. If you're brand new, there are going to be ways in which you think about God, though maybe wrong. It's how we all develop across a spectrum of our understanding of God. But there comes a point where you've been a Christian supposedly so long where you should grow out of the things you thought when you first started. Today, we're going to look at the context of gift measuring, miracles, and arrogance. So I'm going to talk about what infantile Christian love looks like. <clears throat> we can call this the phrase of the stage. Number one, you come to church and you come to faith and you say, what will you give me? So when you think about children, so spiritual faith grows similarly to how we are supposed to grow as humans. So you start out brand new. You start out with this way of thinking, and as you grow, you change, and you mature, and you get older, and your brain, when you're an adult, it should be different than the brain you had when you were younger. Spiritual faith is like that. The spirit and your understanding of God should change when you're older, and when you've done this, and when you've walked with God more than it did when you knew him in the beginning. So in the beginning, like a child, you ask a child, why do you love me? Anybody have ever asked kids, why do you love me? Anybody? Or you don't care? You're like, you ask a child, why do you love me? And almost always, does anybody know what they usually say when they're little? You gave me presents. You take me places. You do things for me. You gave me gifts, you buy me food, you buy me stuff. That's the way a child thinks. Now that is okay, that's the way you start. But when you become an adult and, you're, and you love someone and you go, why do you love me? And there you go, well, it's because you buy me things. You go, whoa, your mom did a number on you. That's not what love is. Okay, And so what will you give me is the measure of love as a child. So we come to faith and we go, God, what are you going to give me? What are you going to do for me? Here are these, Corinthians, these people in Corinth and they're going, God's giving me gifts. I want gifts. Do you have gifts? I don't have the gifts. I need more gifts. I need more stuff. How come God's given me it and not you it? How come you've gotten it and I haven't gotten it? I want gifts. And then some people get the gifts and they go, look at how good my gifts are because God loves me more. Today, you go to many churches, and they go, oh, you don't have this. I have this. You know why? Because you don't have the Holy Spirit, which means God doesn't love you as much, essentially. They just keep going. Gifts are what prove God's love. And so love of God and others is built upon gift getting and gift giving. One of the sweetest things in the world <clears throat> that I can't stand <laughs> is the gifts my kids give me. Let me tell you why. It's sweet. I said it's sweet. I'm balancing it. My daughter, at eight, she makes me all these pictures, and she thinks about me, and she gives me gifts, and it says, I love you, Daddy. And she lays them on my dresser next to my bed where my stuff is supposed to go. And there's like 20 of them. And I don't want to throw them away. 
but I want to throw them away. Come on, you know. You want to, because I need space, but I don't want her to see it, so I have to like wait till she goes to school to put them in the trash can, and then I leave one out. What? You don't save all your, you guys are liars. You're not saving all that, you pack rats. <clears throat> but this is how they express love, and it's sweet at eight. But at 18, the gifts thing doesn't work anymore. Because if you don't love me differently with presence, not presence, but with your presence, with being near, if you don't love me with honesty, with kindness, then you giving me gifts doesn't matter, and you know that. You know that you will no longer measure love as an adult. Somebody goes and buys you a car, your parent buys you something fancy, and you go, wow, they really took care of me. They were never there. That's, that's stuff of therapy. They were never there for me. They didn't have time for me. They were busy providing for me. As an adult, you start to look back and go, the gifts weren't love. The gifts are only great if you're in my life. But remove yourself from my life or treat me poorly and then give me gifts, that's, that's manipulation. There's a self-centeredness to childish, infantile Christianity. Anybody can give a gift or get a gift and have not love. And we know that as an adult. But to an adult, you understand that gifts and love are not synonymous. The greatest gift is to be loved and to love. To be present. To be in your company. To care about you. The other thing kids do. What's another thing kids do? So there's, <clears throat> what will you give me? And we've seen how the Corinthians are doing that. I've got gifts. i got stuff from God. Then there's the other one. Anybody, you watch children, if you serve here or anything, what do they always do? They, they come, what, they're like, Dad, 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 guess what? Look what I can do. Right? It becomes that everyone look at how good I am. My daughter's super smart, but I have to like temper her because she's got my ego and arrogance. So she comes home, she's like, I got, I, I'm 300% in reading. I'm in a seventh grade level. Other kids can't read. And I'm like, dude, don't be a jerk. It's like, look at how good I am. Or it's like, look at how I perform. Look at how much I can do better than others. I can do anything better than you. And then the competition starts. Oh, no, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. <laughs> but it is. This is what we do. Dad, look what I can do. I can do it better. I can do it better. Look at I'm doing things so awesome. This is what the Corinthians are still doing in their faith. <clears throat> look at how often I go to church. Look how many Bible studies I do. Look at how much I've learned. Look at how much theology I have. Look at how more right I am than others. Everybody, look at how good I am. I'm very sinless. Can you believe that person? Like, this is like my daughter. I'm trying to teach her. You don't look at other people. You can be proud of what you do, but don't look at other people and tell them what they're not doing as well as you. And we as Christians, we go, <clears throat> look at what I'm doing. I'm doing, I'm doing good. Can you believe? Did you see Sherry? Sherry ain't living right. Did you know she's doing such an, and the gossip begins? Because what are we doing? We're still being children. We're saying, look at how good I am compared. And let me show you all the people who aren't doing well. Or they're failing in their faith. They don't do as much. They don't know as much. We become proud. Look at how good I am. And love of God becomes a measure of how much knowledge you have, how much theology you have, how many works you have, how much you serve, how much you give. It's based on performance. And then the third thing I thought about what children do, I learned so much from my little eight-year-old from the playground yard. I stopped playing with those friends. Well, why did you stop playing with those friends? Because I had rules and they would not follow my rules in the game. 
I'm like, so you just quit playing? Yeah, I'm not going to play with them. They want to play this way. I don't play that way. And it's like little tiny differences in rules, right? If you don't do things this way, then I won't play with you. Sounds childish, doesn't it? Now, how many of you chose this church on the basis of this principle? You don't do things the way I do things. You don't say things the way I like them said. You don't sing songs the way I like them to be sang. You don't dance the way we like to dance. See, I'm not going to participate because it's not the way I like it. Worship's not the way I like it. Nick doesn't dress the way I like him to dress. Shouldn't he be in suits? Love is based in feeling good and getting what you want the way you want it. It's childish. It majors in the minors. It's black and white thinking. See, when you're a child, everything is right and wrong. It's so clear. When you're an adult, you start going, oh, it is not that easy. I now understand through failure and experience that though I'm trying to make the best decisions I can, there's no right, perfect answer. Every single answer ch choice I make has some complications to it. How do I deal with a rebellious child? What's the right answer? You try your best, but the reality is, is both seem wrong. To be harsh and say, I'm going to do this fine line. To be too loving and let them run roughshod over you. They all seem wrong, but when you're a child, you're like, this is right and this is wrong. And we come to faith and we come to spirituality and we're like, I know exactly what is right and I know exactly what is wrong and I know exactly what God meant by all those confusing words in 2,000 pages of the Bible. I know exactly what he means. And I'm not going to play with you if we differ on any of those words. See, infantile love is based in gifts, performance, and feeling or certainty. I know exactly, and you're not measuring up, and therefore I'm not going to participate or love you that way. See, and here's the deal. When you're a child, you don't know that you're thinking childishly, right? When you're a child and you're certain that your way of playing is the only way to play, all right, I'll hit home. We're about to go into election season, and you're certain what every Christian should do, all right? Aren't you certain? And I don't even know who I'm talking to. I got a smorgasbord of people here, but you're certain. You know exactly what God's planning to do, what needs to be done. You know exactly how the future looks. You are certain what a Christian does. So I'm not going to participate if we disagree. It's not complex at all. Or a choice between two evils. It's definitely not that. It's hard. Even if it's not to you. But see, as a child, you are certain there's no other alternative. There's no way to think about this complexly. And that's what the Corinthians think. They think they're mature. We have special revelation. We have special gifts. We are more powerful. We are smarter. I know exactly how the world is supposed to work. And we're doing it best. See, the great challenge as a mature Christian is seeing this in yourself. Some have been Christians for a long time. You've been successful at a lot of different parts of your life. And yet, maybe you have not matured actually in your faith, but you think you are. There's something we just taught in the class last week in our discipleship class. And we talked about spiritual growth. And the interesting thing is that in this assessment from this guy, James Fowler, he says most people are actually at stage two, which is like childhood to late adolescence. And yet they th that, those are the people we think are mature because they check boxes. 
They're the people who go, oh, I did this, and I did this, and I read this, and I got a good grade in this theology class, and I got a good grade in serving, and I pray a lot, therefore I'm doing good, but you're still very black and white. You can still check boxes. And then we look at people who are asking questions and struggling with God, and we go, oh, they must be immature, when in actuality, that's part of growing up with God, is going, this is hard, and it's humbling. And I have so much to learn. And there's so many things I'm trying to figure out. The great challenge is seeing where you're at in your faith in yourself. Because children don't see it. They are absolutely certain. Teenagers don't see it. They are absolutely certain that the way they feel is the right way. Let me put it this way. Sometimes people bring babies in the service, and I love it. And babies cry and make a lot of noise. And you can be embarrassed, but if you're a parent, that's okay. I expect that when I see a baby. I want them here. And if they cry, I just go, okay, that's all right. Now, if you're talking nonstop during service, I'm like, what is wrong with you? (laughs) If you're babbling, what is wrong with you? Now, as a child, what do you like? You like movies that are what? Do you like... They're, they got excitement, they got bombs, they got action. And as a child, you're like, that's what gets my attention. And you don't want to l- watch Little House on the Prairie. What do you do when you watch Little House on the Prairie? You fall asleep. No, oh, you didn't watch that as a child and be like, I'm staying up all day. Maybe you did. It was made right around the time you graduated college, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, we're friends. Um, but here's my point. But when you're older, you can watch these things, and you go, I see the nuance. I connect with it emotionally. I see the struggle of life, and, and it keeps your attention. So let me put it this way. When a child, an 8-year-old or a 10-year-old, like these young people here, this one here, see, he's falling asleep, and that's okay. I fell asleep as a teenager, too. I was bored in church, and that's fine. You know why? Because it's not exciting. But if you're 40 and still like, I'm tired and I want to watch sports, and I'm bored, you're still a child. Because what we're talking about up here is hard for kids because we're talking about the nuances of your spirit, the nuances of love, the struggle of sin, This is hard for young people, teenagers and younger, to grapple with. But at a certain age, you should be going, yeah, my soul, my investment into relationships, the intricacies and the difficulties of life have crawled and caused anxiety upon me. I need to hear the word. So, Christian, I ask you, do the intricacies of Christ's love keep you awake? Or are you bored? And that tells you something has happened that has stymied your growth, perhaps, in your faith. Tim Keller says this, Babies have short attention spans. Babies, therefore, love the spectacular. Babies love the miracles. They love the big stuff. They love the noisy and the quick. But love is really a matter of the quiet and the lengthy. So today you get a sermon that's a little more quiet and lengthy. (laughs) They love the big stuff. They love the show. They love the feeling. They love the light show. Which is fine when you're a new Christian. But how long have you been here, Christian? And is it any different? We need a mature Christian love is what Paul is telling them. What will you give me turns to how can I serve you and be with you. If you are maturing in your Christian faith, redeemers, then at some point, if you're new, stay new, stay hungry, come. God will meet you in your needs. He has for me. He has for many people in this room. He will do that. But at some point, if you have been making this, saying this is my faith for a period of time, it's got to turn from, God, what more will you do for me to make my life easier? To God, what can I give to you? 
God, how can I give you my attention? How can I give you my work? How can I give you my love, my, my presence? Lord, how can I serve with you and alongside you and be near you better? At some point, that's got to click. Or you've been stymied in childish faith. There's a time when giving gifts is the best thing that my kids can do for me. But there will be a time when those gifts don't suffice anymore. They are nice, but they don't suffice because you should be more mature now. It won't be if my daughter is 24 still writing me pictures and putting them on my nightstand, something's gone wrong. But right now it's sweet and it's meaningful. But at some point her presence and her work and her investment into the family as she matures, it's going to be really important, the nuances of love. If you are a mature Christian faith, everyone, look how good I am, turns to, here are the areas God is still changing in me by his grace. See, when I'm a child, I just want to show you everything I do well. Everything that I'm good at, I want you to know how good I am and how great I am and how I'm better than everybody else around me. But as a mature Christian, at some point, I don't want to brag about all the things I'm great at because if you stare at me too long, you're going to find out the things I know, which is that I have sinfulness, weaknesses, an edgy mouth. You're going to find out things about me. And the best thing I can do as a mature Christian is not be defeated, but to go, I do these things well, yes. I have things that God has gifted me in. But man, if you knew also the ways I'm not yet who I want to be. And I'm saying that truthfully from my perspective. There's so many way, things I am not yet. That I am still becoming. There's so much I don't know. I stand up here and I preach all these words. And I talk about all these things. And yet I know as I read books, I'm like, I don't know. I can try to sound really confident, but there's so many things I am not confident about that I just feel like I know so little about. So I'm going to give you the best I can of the gifts I can to share with you the knowledge of God the best I can, but man, there's so much I don't know. There's so many questions I still have. So all I can offer you is to say, here are the areas God is still changing in me by His grace. I always tell you, and I'll tell you again, the number one thing that drives me nuts is overconfidence in pastors who go, you know, I got something to tell you, and you're going to love it, and it's so good. I don't get it. If you stand and peer into the Word of God, it should be peering back into your soul. And what it should reveal is the work that God still has to do in you and how little you know. So everyone look at how good I am needs to change into an honesty and an authenticity of, yeah, there's things I do well, but gosh, guys, I've got a lot to learn from God. I've got a lot of sin and work that needs to be done on my soul. And I'm, well, I'm going to talk about this in a bit, but you're going to see this in Paul, okay? Lastly, things need to go this way or else I won't play turns into... I know in part, but there is so much I don't know, which is followed by graciousness towards others. When you begin to have humility versus this absolute certainty, you can still believe what you believe. I am not like whimsical about my belief. I have very strong beliefs, and yet I understand that I probably don't have the whole picture. So I'm not wishy-washy. I know what I believe about things, but to the best of my ability is what I say. Here's what I believe about this social issue or about God. Here's what I've come to, but man, there's so much I do not know. And so when I see somebody who differs with me on anything but Christ and his salvation and my eternal life through him, 
if you differ with me on anything but that, I, I go, here's what I think. I think I understand to the best of my ability, but I can love you. I can love you. I can love you. You don't believe in Jesus, but I can get along with you. I can talk to you because I don't know a lot. And this isn't so black and white for me anymore. Not because I'm wishy-washy, but because I know in part and I prophesy in part. But I know that when I get to heaven, God's going to go, let me show you something. I'm going to be like, I wasn't, this world is not even what I thought it was. My understanding of it was minute. As I look out into the heavens and I look out into the stars and I look out, out of the trillions of galaxies, I realize I have no idea what's going on around me or how I even exist, but I put my faith in Christ. See, friends, you can be in church for 20 years and still appear to think like a two-year-old. You know that? You can go, I've been in church 22 years, and yet you're still fighting about things that are so small. I've been in church for 22 years. You should see all the spiritual gifts. My grandpa put his name on that building, and I did the same. I should have say and power over what happens. There was once somebody who came to me, and they said, and this is a person who's been a Christian for 30 years, and they said, hey, we're leaving. And I said, that's fine. I need more space in the seats. <clears throat> but I like these people. I looked up to these people. I thought they were great. I said, why? They're like, I don't have enough mentorship here. There's nobody else who will mentor me. On one end, they're right. We have a long ways to go. We need more seasoned people to say, I'm going to disciple and mentor others. But on the other end, I sat there and thought, you've been a Christian for like 30, 40 years. Why are you not looking around the church going, there's no mentors here. I need to go be one for people. Why are you 40 years going, this church doesn't fit because I need more mentors? You know when I needed a mentor? I always do. But you know when I needed it most? When I was a child. When I had no idea how anything worked at all. At some point, though, my job as a mature Christian is to go, other people need this. Now, I'm still looking for mine as well. And I still have people in my life that speak into it, but I, at 30 years of doing this thing, should be looking around going, what about the people who are brand new and don't have anybody? And if I see a gap in church, I don't go, it's not serving me. I go, how do I fix that? See, mature love is based in presence, grace and humility, and long-suffering. <clears throat> this Corinthians passage says, love is patient. But one of my favorite translations is they translate patience to long-suffering. And I think, what an amazing word. Patience is long-suffering. That I am going to stick with you. Even when it's not going my way. Even when I don't understand certain things. Even when you fail to do things the way I think you should. I'm going to suffer with you. Because that's mature love. So Paul says, where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, many of you have come from churches where they elevated your giving, your gifts, your tongues, your prophecies. And again, none of this says these things don't exist like some churches. They just say, why are you making them such a big deal? They're not going to be in heaven. They're temporary things for a sinful world. They're going to cease to exist, and you're super proud of them. They're like a sandcastle. They're going to be washed away, and you're like, look at what I built. For we know in part, here's the humility of him, of Paul, and we prophesy in part. But when the end comes, when completeness and perfection comes in heaven, what is in part disappears. See, the gifts go away, the powers go away, the self-centered feelings, they go away. You know what's even crazy? Faith goes away. You know why? Because when you're in faith and you're in heaven, you don't need faith anymore. You're with him. 
Hope goes away. We hope because we live in a broken world. We hope because we see sinfulness and pain and suffering. We go, I hope for a greater kingdom in Christ. But that goes away because we have it and we receive it. But love never fails. Everything you think you know and think you are good at and great, it all comes to nothing. So why are we still dancing like an eight-year-old going, look at what I can do? Because the only thing that matters is a love that is patient, a love that is kind, a love that does not envy, and a love that does not boast, that is not proud, that is not self-seeking, that seeks no pleasure in wrongs. You know, when I look back, I think about how I understood love. As a child, I understood it the way I described it. I always think that I, at 18, I had this girlfriend I thought I would marry. And as I look back, I felt great love. I felt it. And yet I didn't love her the way I understand love today. Because it was selfish. As soon as I stopped feeling it, I would distance and break up. As soon as I felt it again, that's love. And the, but now that I'm a man... I understand that, that that was childish thinking. That my relationship of love of God doesn't mean he always does what I want and I always have to feel good. That I always have to feel excited. That every time I come to church, I got to feel it. I understand that there will be seasons of dryness, but love is still there. I understand that there will be times in which I'm like, where are you? Why is this not happening? But your love is still there. Because as a man, I put childish thinking behind me. Love is not gifts, power, performance, or feeling good. Love is kindness, contentment, humility, long-suffering. That means I will be patient and bear even when you cease to give me exactly what I want the way I think it should be. Amen? Amen? I will continue to be there. And this is what God has said to me. I will continue to be there in Mr. Jones. Even when you don't love me the way I think you should. And know you should. Even when you don't have gratitude the way I would love you to. Even when you don't serve me. God will love me with that mature, unconditional love and long-suffering. Even as Christ displays himself upon the cross. He says, this is the long-suffering of my love for you. Even when you hate me. It is not based on feeling or the amazing miracles, but our salvation is based in his willingness to love when it was not going the way it should. It's time for us as redeemers to grow up. So I ask you, this is your own self-reflection. Are you bored? Are you disinterested? Do you need the spectacle? Do you want me to dance for you? Do you find yourself absolutely angry that people don't believe exactly as you? Are you cantankerous like a Karen about others' differences? Sorry, Karen. It's an unfortunate reality for your life. Do you measure church based on how you feel? Maybe you're not more different than 18-year-old me who thought love was about passionate feelings and not long-suffering. Because mature love isn't about them anymore. It's the small presence. It's the gift of service. And it's the willingness to keep loving when it doesn't go my way. So how do we get there? How do we grow up into mature Christians? 
How do we stop making church a spectacle that needs to meet my needs and show everybody my giftedness? The only thing I've learned about love, I learned from Jesus. Every time I want to quit every relationship that's hard for me, I look at Jesus and his love for me. His patient endurance for my doubt and my sinfulness and my infidelity in faith. He is patient with me. He is kind to me when I don't deserve it. So every time I look at, a, at love and church and faith and go, this isn't working. This isn't making me feel good. I realize that Christ could have said the same thing on the cross for me. That begins to mature you if you take it seriously. That when you look at Jesus on the cross, you see that he stayed put for love. Here's the interesting thing about Paul. I'm closing here, but here's the interesting thing about Paul. Paul was brilliant. Paul was gifted. Paul didn't walk with Jesus like the disciples walked with Jesus. He encountered a revelation of Christ. Jesus, after he had resurrected, revealed himself to Paul in a fantastic vision. It blinded him, but he, he revealed himself in the truth of the gospel in a way that you and I probably have never experienced. So Paul changes his whole life. He does radically good things. He plants churches. He has incredible knowledge. He is theologically better than everyone here. He is brilliant. He is gifted. He can speak well. He's got power. And he encountered Christ. And not only did he encounter Christ to come to Jesus, he then says in 2 Corinthians that he came to a place where God actually took him out of his body to heaven and revealed things no one could imagine. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, he's going to talk about revelations and visions, and he says, I know a man, and he's talking about himself in Christ, who 14 years ago was caught up to a third heaven, whether it was in body or out of body, I don't know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and he heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. He's saying, I experienced a revelation of God and it's amazing, but in my body, I will not boast about anything but my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think more of me is warranted by what I say or do. Or because of these surpassing great revelations, because I have so much knowledge about God, so many prophetic utterances. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. He didn't do what I said. Instead, he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, for I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that, pow Christ, so that Christ's power may rest on me. He says, I have a lot to boast about. He says this in multiple parts of the Bible. I know more than you. I've gone, I've, God's revealed deeper things to me than you. But you know what I, what I was given? I was given something that doesn't feel right or good. I have a thorn in my flesh. It could be sin. It could be an illness. I don't know. God knows. But he says, I asked God to take away this pain. And he said, what you're learning is that my grace is sufficient, that that is what you need. He didn't give Paul exactly what he wanted. He didn't make him feel good the way he wanted to feel good. But Paul said, I know that the means to power is that I will share my weaknesses with you. The fact that I don't know as much as I think I know. I prophesy in part and I know in part. 
But I understand that I know very little at all compared to the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ that I will encounter in heaven. I was on the phone with one of my best friends, and there's been some cool God things going on. We were sharing about these things where we're like, I think it's God. I think God's doing something, and it could be even here at Redeemers. There's some stuff that I think God is doing. And my friend said, he goes, I always hedge. I don't want to say it's God. I, it seems like it's God. It seems fairly miraculous. It seems very pointed, but I don't want to say it's God. He goes, maybe I lack faith. And I said, no, I do the same thing. It's not because I lack faith in God. It's that I have grown mature and I know that no matter how perfect God is, I will find a way to mess it up. I will find a way to hear what I want and not what God is saying. That I don't trust my own perfection to understand God fully. So I think God is doing a powerful work, but I'm not going to tell you, oh, I know that I know. Not because God isn't trustworthy, but because as a man, I know the complexities of my spirit and the tendencies of my sin and the lack and, and the amount of knowledge I do not have. And I don't have that much faith in myself. God, I believe, is doing some pretty great things. But I know in part, and I prophesy in part, that I know I will not fully understand and know because of my sinfulness, my weaknesses, and the fact that I will not know until I stare at him face to face. Friends, it's time for us to grow up. If you're new to faith, don't be offended by what I'm saying. You're right where you need to be. God will meet your needs. He'll meet you where you're at. But if you've been sitting in church and you're still talking like this, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says and what Paul says, which is you're being infants. And that's not meant to put you down. That's meant to push you to start thinking like a mature Christ follower. And a mature Christ follower goes from a give me mentality, what am I getting out of this, to a gratitude and giving mentality. God, I'm thankful for what you have given me, for what is good, for the Spirit and the Holy Spirit you give me, for the miracles you have done. I'm not always coming to get out of you. Look at how good I am becomes here are my sins, scars, and weaknesses. A mature Christian doesn't walk around trying to think themselves better than others. He says, I got thorns in my flesh. I've done a lot. I do good. I do as best as I can. But man, I still have stuff. And God is still working on me. And a mature Christian doesn't have certainty in what they know. And all the things they know, they have humility. They go, I think to the best of my ability, based on what the Holy Spirit has shown me in my life. Here's what I believe. But I know in part, and I prophesy in part, and this is Paul, but I will not know as I am to know until I see him face to face. Friends, it's time to grow up. And the only way you're going to do that is to begin taking seriously the word of God to begin taking seriously this idea of I'm going to spend time in the presence of God. I'm going to share my sins with God. I'm going to go and participate in the life of the body of Christ with God. Next week you have an opportunity to say, God, grow my spirit, grow my knowledge. I want to know you. You must mature because if you just keep coming every so often as it meets your needs, you will stay as infants as if you stayed two years old in your body. And what Paul is saying is to know perfect love is to know Christ deeply. That love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It keeps no records of wrongs.
Amen? If you'll worship with us. Call. 